Wendy Jensen, and we're doing another segment of World War II, A Look Back. This time we're lucky enough to have Robert E. Johnson, or Bob, as he's commonly called, who has written a, a book about his memories of World War II. I recently read this, and it's just a darling book. I really like it. Uh, so I'll kind of let you get started. You wanted to do a little bit of um, prepping, you said. Well, first of all, uh, any GI in, in, that ever was, <clears throat> was first a, a civilian. Uh, and every, every soldier was not born a soldier. So what I was thinking about is what happens before you get in service. So I was working in Indianapolis at Rockwood Manufacturing Company. I was in charge of a finished goods warehouse. And I could see the writing on the wall because it was a, uh, they had um, uh, plas or not plastic, but cast iron pulleys and, and, and die cast pulleys and all that sort of thing. And, uh, the war effort was getting to the point where material was getting scarcer and scarcer. And I happened to see an article in the paper that the Signal Corps was looking for civilian employees or trainees so that they could repair radios. And they would pay us and teach us. And I was married at the time. and, and uh, Look pretty good to me, so I I took uh, the physical, passed exams, and then we had, had to go to school. Uh, I was it would run 24 hours a day, you know, eight to three or whatever. When I finished finished the course, and a colonel from Fort Hayes in Columbus, Ohio, came out one night, and as we finished, he said. Fellas, he said, you're subject to the draft the way you are right now. He said, why don't you enroll in the Enlisted Reserve Corps? So if you are drafted, you know where you're going. Well, so we all did. And we finished the course, and, and about maybe two or three weeks later, we got draft notices to report. I reported out to Fort Benjamin Harrison. I passed my physical and, and uh, got uniformed. And I showed how wonderful the Army is. We had one man at, in the group that was taking his physical. He had one leg about that much shorter than the other leg. In five seconds, he could have seen that he wasn't drafting material. But he ran through the whole program the whole day, and, and but when everybody wound up, then he told me he, did, he wasn't going to go, which was pretty obvious from the beginning. But anyway, so later on, I had orders to report to Camp Crowder, Missouri, for basic training in a signal corps, which is uh, quite a ways away from Indianapolis, but down in the Ozarks. Finished my basic training down there. I never saw a radio. And when I got through the basic training, they transferred me and several others into a heavy transport uh, company, which meant we drove jeeps, trucks, six by sixes, what have you, and through the Ozarks, up and down and around. And, and about the time I was supposed to complete that training, they took 1,200 of us and shipped us to Fort Eustis, Virginia, Coast Artillery, and took basic training all over again. They took away everything they had to do with Sigma Corps and, and issued Coast Artillery equipment. We weren't happy, and uh, in fact, we were very unhappy that we had to do that over again. 
And uh, then so man come one of the non coms came around one day and wanted to know if I wanted to be a gunner. And I informed him that I didn't care about being a gunner. Only I didn't use those words. And uh, it wasn't too long after that that I got transferred, uh, shipped down to Camp Davis, North Carolina, which was a, uh, a radar school at the, at, out on uh, Outer Banks. So I couldn't tell where I was or what I was doing or anything. When I finished my, my training in the radar, then I was sent to um, Camp uh, Camp Han in California at Riverside, and that was a, a supposedly uh, anti-aircraft camp. I never saw radar there. I was working on, on a rifle range and an infiltration course and. Uh, no radio. I didn't see radio. And if and if I got through there, they uh, they had uh, uh, dental. They had to go to the infirmary and they checked their teeth. Well, and it was another fellow and myself. We got everybody went back to the barracks and we had to go wait in, on the porch or on the on the step. And uh, so finally they called me in the dentist office, and then uh, they made so there's a major and some other officer there. I don't remember his name, but uh, he said, "Yeah, I think we we we, we better send him to the hospital." And this was on a Friday, and of course I didn't know what they're talking about. The hospital, yeah. I, he said, you've got a, a full-grown supernumerary in your roof of your mouth. You have to take it out. And I had a, a eye tooth that had a cap on it I used to take off and when I brushed my teeth and cleaned it. Well, my wife was out there in Riverside and I had a pass up coming up that weekend and so I, uh, I questioned the, going to the hospital. But anyway, he said, the doctors, uh, the, said, well, well, we'll send you Monday. So I did. I wound up in the hospital. In the meantime, the rest of the guys I was with, they all took off. I had no idea where they were going. Eventually, I left uh, uh, Fort Ord and uh, went up to, I mean, up Camp uh, Camp Hunt in Fort Ord, and then I went over, went overseas. I went wound up in New Caledonia, and I think it was Camp Twos. It's been a long time. So here I had all this experience. So I find myself in plans and training at, at, at Camp Twos. There, I was working on a uh, jungle training range. We were training on, on uh, the, what to do and what not to do with hand grenades and all this kind of stuff. And they trained some of the guys going to the replacement depot, and they non-com use it would demonstrate a great grenade. Said if you pull a pin and you accidentally drop it or you drop it, don't try to outrun it because you, you can't do it. And so and on purpose you'd accidentally drop it. And of course the guys would scatter and then you come in and chew them out for running because it was a, it was a dud. But uh, that was one of the things that uh, we had there. And, and uh, I had, uh, they had a training range there too with uh, Jungle training range with surprise targets and uh, worked with plastic explosives, TNT, dynamite, you name it, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And nothing to do with the radio. 
and they're going through the course when they're taking a bunch of people through the course. And I set off a booby trap, and it's a blasting cap, and we'd set them off. Uh, my guys going through, and but this one caught me on, a, uh, on a, under my helmet. Increase. I felt like I had a hit on the head with a baseball bat. So the next day we shipped out, and I got in the, I got aboard ship. And I went in the head, and woke, look up in the mirror, and my face was all puffed up. So they put me in sick bay. They fed me. I, I remember there was 24 sulfur pills, horse pills, you know, some other stuff, and. Uh, which wasn't good at all. But it was a sea devil. It was a merchant marine ship. The rest of the guys were in the hold eating K rash and C rash. And I was in sick bay on a, on a uh, it was not a military vessel, but a, a USS sea devil, which what do we call it now? Anyway, so I was eating civilian chow out there mashed potatoes and bread, uh, steak and all that kind of, and uh, that was that was really fun. I, I, of course, I felt bad for those other guys <laughs> eating, <laughs> eating key ration. But, uh, then when it went up to to a uh, lady, that was, I think it was the second day of the invasion, and they landed on a lady, and there I replaced uh, a radar operator that was killed on the landing. But the night that we got there was after dark and we had to go up a uh, replacement depot or whatever you call it, first night. And it was hot and uh, it wasn't very, uh, very pleasant. As far as the smell was concerned, that it could hold your nose, but it was dark, so we went up, and then the next morning they came back and assigned me to an outfit, and I could see what was causing all the stink because there was a rice paddy out a little bit off the road, and there was three, four dead Japs out there all bloated up and stinking up the atmosphere. But uh, that was some greeting, but. Uh, then I replaced a radar operator that had been killed when he landed in the invasion. But the, the, the radar that they had was different than the one that I was trained on. And, but it was supposed to be the latest radar, but when the, the radar picked up a plane and it went through the clouds, then the radar would stop and hunt on the clouds. It wouldn't wouldn't follow the plane. It just oh, just yeah. so that was the, the, that was not very good. So they had to, they got a got an older type gun laying radar that we practiced on, and then it would that would take the plane and follow through the through the cloud. And um, there was quite a bit of activity there because the Japanese. Planes came through the pass at Ormoc. It was, it was uh, west of us, come through the pass in the mountains. So we we kept pretty busy there, and uh, that was uh, Christmas. About Christmas time, we had uh, the Japan, uh, the Filipinos uh, were in. Uh, a couple of men, or Filipino men, were working with the cooks as roustabouts and capings and that kind of stuff. And since I was a replacement and I was not with the original battery, I slept with the cooks in the cook tent. And after we get through in the evening, it was quiet. The cooks would, would go over to this uh, one of these Filipino. Uh, routes about so his family he had a wife and two little kids and he, he could uh, he sit over there and they'd offer us tuba 
which is a, a mildly fermented, uh, like a coconut cider, I guess you call it. Uh, and they had red tuba and white tuba. And they said, well, sir, said you, one of the women said, sir, you better drink some of the red tuba because if you get dysentery, if you drink the white tuba. So I, did, I drank some red tuba and I got dysentery, but anyway, <laughs> uh, that was uh, that was par for the course. But uh, we we had uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, trouble with the radar. Anyway, the old man, the captain, said, that "I want you to go to another battery, and another fellow and I, and and." Um, get some practice, get used to it. So we went up at Ormock, on the crossroad at Ormock. Now we were supposed to be picked up by a truck about noon. So I got up to Ormock and uh, there's no truck and we waited and finally there was an engineer outfit across the road from us. We sat on, a, or stood on a crossroad and we bummed some chow from not only dinner, but uh, night uh, for supper too. We spent the whole, the whole night there, and we could see all kinds of activity with the uh, anti-aircraft. But uh, come daybreak, uh, MP came by, and we nailed him, and he got a ride to the battery that was supposed to be going to. And we and we got up the road and uh, some of the Filipinos had gotten a hold of it. There's a couple of Japs and uh, you know, they would, took care of it. But anyway, so that basically is what I was doing until we got the orders to go to Okinawa and that was something else. But, um, I was went on the west the west side of Okinawa. We was, I was on a loading detail. I was supposed to unload the, unload the equipment. Another fellow, we, another fellow and I, we were on the detail and, and they got the ship unloaded and the uh, LSM come up alongside. And it was, the sea was getting kind of rough, so we had the net over the side and, and we started to go down the, the side of the ship, and if you if you didn't step on it when it was coming up, you had a long step down. But anyway, uh, it was banging against the, the side of the ship, and the old man told him to cast off. So you know, I think there was six or eight of us anyway that on this LSM. Make a long story short, we set out in that flat bottom boat, if you want to call it that, offshore for about 13 days before we could get ashore. They tried to put us ashore and the beach master ordered them off. So when I finally did get up to my outfit, uh, the old man had captain and he had orders on his desk already to buck him up to battalion to missing in action. Well, that would have been fine, uh, fine news to get my my folks, but we got there in time, but uh, that was uh, the first time. You know, we set up east of Kadena Airstrip, and uh, they had uh, a short patrol there. They had a long gun on the east side of Okinawa and the, on the Pacific side, and they would they would lob a few shelves in the Kadena and they could fire over a battery and you could hear it and you just wait for the kaboom and uh, wish that the no short rounds. And then we moved up to Kin and uh, I was up on north north of uh, Kadena and that's where I was when the war ended. But that island was uh, Honeyfall with tunnels and underground chambers and, and 
fact, one day I was down on the beach and, and I saw this little bush and there was a hole behind it. I looked and went, went down and checked it out and it was about so big around it, about 10 feet into, into the hole it was full of water so it didn't go any further. But, that uh, in the kamikazes, they, they 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 really gave it to the ships in the harbor because they they you swear that they couldn't the fly couldn't live through the ak ak and they stepped kept on coming and that was uh, that was not so good but uh, that was that was most of it the long and short of it so. Oh, that pretty much covers that. Yeah, you have any, anything you want to know? I, I guess you went, you're about at the part that of your story that I noticed. Um, I wanted to hear more about the kamikaze planes. You said it was Japanese for divine wind. Yes, yeah, they uh, they flew. You swear that I don't know where they were stationed, but they they pasted uh, ships in the harbor, loading ships and, and landing craft, and they uh, they kept coming. And uh, you swear that. Uh, they, with the act, act they couldn't a fly couldn't give to it, but they kept coming on, and that was uh, that was our main main uh, threat that we had. Uh, we had to get them on the. We had a our, a radar was a we had a gun laying radar. It was it had a computer that not only uh, set the the fuse time on the ninety millimeters. Gave the direction the was in the whole bit, and uh, so it was pretty much automatic as far as getting a uh, getting the uh, shell and the gun. I, I my job was a I was in uh, elevation and azimuth and range, and we had there were three of us on the crew, and uh, uh, and after the war was over. We had sandbags on our radar, which was dug in, so only our antenna was at ground level. Everything else was below ground. And when after the war ended, they took the sandbags off the off the radar. And right where I was sitting, there was this metal roof. After where I was sitting, there was a groove right in a shell. It come through. It didn't get through the through the roof or I wouldn't have been here, but uh, that was that's a close call. The, but there's... Uh, I know you report on a friend of yours named Howard was sitting on his cot writing a letter. Is it, is it this in the same place? Yeah. Okay. He had a peg driven into the dirt wall and had his cartridge belt hanging on the pad, peg by his cot. He heard the alert and he decided to get off the cot and lie down on the dirt because of the raid, which was something we'd done before. But that night when he got up on the bed, he saw that there was a big jagged piece of steel that had pinned his cartridge belt to the wall. So had he been sitting there, it would have been curtains as far as he was concerned. Well, we had a, our radar was in a trench and, and his, he had his cot on the end of the radar, you know, all it was above ground was just the antenna. And uh, like I said, he 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 never he never got off of it. He sat there, what you know, the stuff was overhead. But this particular night, thing, they came in and and uh, uh, got. Uh, we were on a hill, and they dropped some uh, bombs on the. Uh, the side, and this is one of them. That, uh, uh, but I was in, I was inside, so I wasn't out. But uh, uh, we had, we had one guy 
<clears throat> name is Ziganoff from out east, and I don't know where he got it, but he moonlight requisitioned a, a BER, and he's on perimeter guard one night, and we hooked up, our radar was hooked up to the uh, CP and the uh, guns. And, he, he had a, about two o'clock in the morning. He turned the crank and he called. He could hear the speakers, and and he stuttered. And he, he asked, "Captain, is there something out here?" And he said, the "Captain said, well, don't shoot unless you let you see something." So pretty soon, it's just about two o'clock in the morning. So pretty soon they let loose of that BAR, and of course it's when he did that, all the guys who were asleep, you know, they had to come and he thought we were under some kind of attack. Come daylight, there was the deadest goat you ever saw, you know, you know oh. <laughs> full of holes. Oh. But uh, that pretty much, pretty much it. And when the when they dropped the bomb and then yeah, we uh, were happy. And then they, they said, the radio said that there was a shortage of shipping because the troops couldn't come home. And from where we could, where we were located, we could see half a dozen or more sitting at, at anchor, you know, waiting for ships. And I don't know who did, but somebody got Word to Drew Pearson, and uh, wasn't too long after that, and they started getting busy. But uh, that was pretty much it. No, anything else? That just hit the highlights. Yeah, I uh, I have this other part marked. It's you said after they dropped the bomb. You're talking about the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that ended the war. Yeah. Yeah. It, you wrote. It's hard to describe the feelings that we had when the word came through that they had dropped the bomb and the Japanese were suing for peace. There was a plane that was painted white with blue crosses on the yeah. side that took the peace emissaries to Manila. Yeah. They had taken off from the airstrip at Ayashima. Ayashima, yeah. That's when, where Ernie Pyle was killed. Oh, okay. When they were up in the air, we could see them. I remember that, and I remember feeling the feeling that we had when we realized that the war was over and the pressure was off. It was just unbelievable and something that one just cannot describe. No, no. Can you describe it now? This, the feeling was just, was it just a, such a relief? Well, one of my non-coms was a pretty tough guy. When it, was, <clears throat> when it finally sank in that it was over, he cried, and I think most of us felt like it, but uh, because it was, uh, it was, it was over. But. Uh, and then everyone wanted to go home. Oh, did we ever? <laughs> did we ever? So. So we came back. On, I came back on the Admiral Benson. It's a brand new ship, and the skipper must have been in a hurry because he traveled about 23, 24 knots all the way back, and he was supposed to land in Seattle, and uh, the orders were changed, and now it's going to San Francisco, and then finally it was decided they would put put in in San Pedro, which is fine because at uh, Camp Anson, uh, my wife is in Los Angeles, so that was pretty nice, and she didn't know I was coming that she didn't have a phone. And, uh, so I walked in on her and that was a big reunion. Oh, what did she say when she saw you? Oh, I don't remember. Oh, <laughs> I bet she screamed. <laughs> I don't remember. Okay. I, I'd like to ask everyone about the mail and, and presents, packages that they received when they were in the service. If you had a, a favorite one, you know, what, what is your best present or piece of mail that you ever got? Well, I was for my, my, my wife wrote me most every day. 
and I would say, but we when we get mail, we'd probably get a dozen letters, and yeah, and when there'd be a long time between the mail call and guys would get, get newspapers, it wouldn't make any difference where they were from. The guys would uh, it was something to read from, and you could read about people that you had no idea, you know, mm -hmm. but that was something to read, and uh, uh, it was it was good morale. At Christmas time, I, that was the holidays was always uh, a little. Missed that when you missed it. So, but that's it. I'm glad it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I do wouldn't want to do it again for a million dollars, and I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience. So, but uh, you have to live it. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you came back. Well, I'm glad I came back, too. No. What was your rank when you came out? I was a high-ranking PFC. I got, uh, when I was in, in Okinawa, the captain put me in for non-com, for stripes. But they had some kind of a regulation at that time that if you couldn't couldn't make somebody who was ugly or <clears throat> disfigured or something that uh, is a non they had to look like everybody else. Well, I got a birthmark, so that that was it. I but I automatically got a PFC, so I, that's what high-ranking PFC. But I was 30 years old when I went in service, so I, I had a little bit of an edge. And the rest of the kids were 18, 19, 20. So uh, uh, it was, uh, it wasn't too bad. But uh, I worked in uh, uh, sort of a, make, not quite a PF or PX, but a little of that kind of stuff. But that was it. So, of course, that's... Is there anything else you can think of that you want to well, talk about? Well, I, I can think of it, but I'd better not say anything. <laughs> I know, I read your book. <laughs> I understand. Well, should we wind up here, Bob? Yeah, should we uh, wind up here, you said? Yeah, end here. Thank you so much for coming in Glad and talking. You, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of guys in this town that, that uh, should be interested in leaving a biography for their grandchildren, children, and uh, I think it's a good idea, and I think it's uh, should get the historical society involved in this thing too, because go down at senior citizens and take a look at the, the old newspaper files that they've got there, 1945, 67. The amount of people in this town that uh, served in armed forces is just amazing. Hi, I'm Wendy Jensen, and my guest is Earl Fritzke. His Nickname is Tiny. He said he picked that up somewhere along the line when he was younger. He is a veteran of the Korean War, so we're going to take a look back at the Korean War with Tiny, if you'll tell us about it. I think where we want to start is the beginning of your service time. He okay. said, "Well, I'm a, a Korean War draftee, and I was drafted in." April of 1951, and I was sent to Fort Sheridan to Fort McCall in Alabama, which is Anniston, southeast of Chattanooga, Tennessee, trained in the Chemical Corps, which, can which consisted of flamethrowers, uh, smoke generating, and 
poisonous gas. They did, we were trained in that too. And this was April of 51, and I spent 11 months, I don't know, marking time in Alabama. And then pretty soon the order came for the Far East Command. Well, that meant a little trip of the Hiawatha to the Seattle, and then to Yokohama, Japan, and I, I remember the Mount Fuji coming up out of the horizon with the snow capped and the smoke on or the volcano part of it. Uh, that's a striking memory. And then we traveled by train to the Sasebo, Japan, to the, the southernmost island, and then we were loaded on a ship and were sent to Incheon. And we landed on Incheon, the, the landing craft business, and it was called the Red, and Green, and Blue Beach. And you should see it today. It's all full of condominiums. So when I got there, I didn't need no smoke generators or flamethrowers or that, and I got transferred into the engineers, the army engineers, building a bridge across the, the bridges, I should say. Uh, we were in the 84th engineer group, uh, and I was in C Company, 1st platoon. And the first bridge I got acquainted with was uh, part of the Trans-Siberian Railroad that there was a double box girder bridge that went from, the railroad went from Pusan to Seoul to uh, join the Trans-Siberian Railroad up in Manchuria. And we were repairing that bridge. We were on the Injim River, which is a strange river. It was about 15 miles from the seacoast. And uh, the Bay of Injim has some of the highest tides in the world. During full moon, the water rises 40 feet. So. Here's this farm boy, so to speak, floating on this river, and one six hours it's flowing one way, and then six hours later it's flowing back the other way, and we're going up and down. I guess the height difference was about 30 feet where we were. Well, we eventually repaired this bridge, which, I'm skipping ahead, uh, I got back to Korea in 97, and I got a chance to drive across this bridge that's still going. It's near the Freedom, it's called the Freedom Gate Bridge. And it's still standing, so we did okay, I guess. And then uh, when we got the bridge reopened, because the water fluctuated so much, you couldn't have a pontoon bridge or a low-level bridge, it'd get flooded. And the uh, Jim River was subject to summer floods, so some, it would uh, raise 50 to uh, 75 feet. So this bridge was 200 feet above water that went across the high-level railroad bridge. And so we had to fix that bridge, and then we went up the stream oh, in November of that year and uh, started on what you call the X-ray bridge, or it's called the Libby Bridge. And it, it's equal to in the I-90 bridge across the Wisconsin River. Uh, I left before the bridge was done. Uh, uh, it was finished in July 4th of 1953, but I left in late March of 53, and I've got pictures of the bridge, and uh, nobody can drive across it. It's wired for explosives. They can blow it up at any minute. The North and South Korea are still got their little feud going. So. I'd like to switch over. I got back to uh, Sasebo, Japan. What I remember, they fed us a steak and a quart of real milk and real butter. Mm -hmm. I think we all ate a quarter pound stick of butter and drank a quart of milk right down the Rimwald Gulp. And uh, that was far cry from the chlorinated powdered milk or powdered eggs or powdered everything. I still can't get over the temperature in Korea, 20, 30, 40 below in the wintertime. Uh, when you talk about the Marines freezing, that, that was. Well, then, I guess I, the prettiest sight in my book was it took 17 days to come home on a M.L. Howells merchant ship from Sasebo, Japan, to see the Golden Gate Bridge silhouette with the lights come up out of the horizon at 2 o'clock in the morning. You should have heard the cheer on the boat there. Well, I got discharged in Camp Carson, Colorado, took the rocket, the Burlington Zephyr train home to Chicago, and uh, uh, 
overnight from Chicago. That's when the old train, I bought a new watch at the PX, and that's when the old trains well, were going 100 miles an hour through the Kansas wheat fields, but our railroads have disappeared. Well, there was no brass band when you got home, you filtered back home. I remember take, got to the Northwestern Depot, which train was going to go to Janesville first or Beloit first. I took the one to Beloit because it was a, leaving a couple hours earlier. Got to Beloit, hitched back home. That's how you filtered back home. But in 97, I had the chance to return to Korea with my son, who was a former university student, to visit people that he knew from his English tutoring in Korea or in a university up here. He, oh, there, so we visited our, my bridge again in the company area. I think the highlight of Korea was the Japanese have occupied Korea for 50 years from about 1905 to the Korean War, and they chopped every tree down for firewood. They to go back to Korea and see all the trees back. Well, that's the strangest sight in the world, to see a country that didn't have no trees and, and see them all back. Uh, <coughs> So in 97, I visited that and the historic sites of Korea. And my uh, Korean Army, engin or the Army engineers started a reunion 11 years ago from a, a, one of the boys in Oregon and one in Louisiana. And it was six people to start with, and now we're going to our 12th annual reunion in Burlington, Vermont this year in July, and somebody says, why are you going to uh, Burlington, Vermont in July? It's, it's not pretty then. He says, you can't afford the hotel rooms in the fall when everybody would want to go. And uh, John and Mary Bourne are hosting the reunion this year in Burlington, Vermont. And before Grandma Von Trapp died, she was her last long-term care nurse of her uh, Ron Trapp family at Stowe, Vermont. And the Stowe, Vermont uh, ski lodge burned down many or 15, 20 years ago and they rebuilt it. But what a connection with uh, Mary Bond. That, uh, she was the nurse that took care of Grandma Van Trapp. Uh, some of the s stories that you run across. Well, at my last reunion in Milwaukee this year, or last Memorial Day, I won two round trip tickets to Korea via the Korean airline for a first prize of, they're trying to build a Korean National Memorial down in Tuscola, Illinois, which is 25 miles south of Champaign-Urbana. So if I and my son went back there, and, uh, I wore my hat going back there and anybody that's 50 years old, they come right up to you and shake your hand, uh, thank you, thank you. In fact, one day we got lost on the subway and this 60-year-old man purposely took us, got off the train where he is because we took the wrong train. One went to Incheon, another one to Suwon, and we got on the wrong train. He purposely got us off the depot and rode us back to get us on the right train and went to the station that we were going to. Uh, the, the, the older people are thankful. But in my visit this fall or last October, November, um, uh, I ran across the, the Korean family over there that took, uh, put us up because she wanted her son and daughter, or their daughter and son, the daughter was 14 years old and the son was 10 years old, they wanted to experience uh, some conversation with a foreigner. So one of the ladies that my son knew, knew this couple, the Park family, who he is, he is a junior executive in the, the, the Korean equivalent of United Parcel. And uh, so they, we stayed with those people, slept on the floor, ate their meals, and. The 14-year-old daughter is so interested in learning English that she's coming to America to even go to the high school and definitely the university. And uh, that was, and the Park family took me down to my the war memorial in Korea, which has every state in the Union listed. Our 33,000 so 
700 dead in every state is listed. In, in Wisconsin, I found that plaque. And there's five names I know that are dead. My cousin Jack Anderson, a neighbor boy, I dropped out of school early, Lloyd, Lloyd Busman. Um, a classmate of mine, Fred Pierce, had quit school early. His name is there. And a kid that moved to Janesville, uh, Maynard Salbach, uh, he transferred high schools, but I consider him a classmate of mine. And another classmate of mine, uh, Don Shaw, who, who five of my so-called classmates got killed in the Korean War. Nowhere in America they have a, a list of the Korean War dead on any bronze plaque or anything. Um, and I guess another highlight of the trip was Seoul. I went there and celebrated my 21st birthday by going to the PX. And here was a bombed out city. No, not a pane of glass, a, a street light working, all full of beggar children trying to get something to eat or you couldn't stop to help them or you'd be mugged, so to speak, and mauled over. And then to go back to Seoul now and see a, a city of 12 million people, 50 miles east and west and 30 miles north and south. And, uh, it just amazes you. And I guess Korea has the 12th uh, um, ranking of the economy of the world countries, you know. And so um, and I've developed a, quite a friendship with the Korean people with our visits there. And, they're very appreciative. You should see, hear, read some of the letters that you hear from those people when you translate English or a foreign language into our language, you know, English. And uh, like, like Bob said, uh, I wouldn't take a uh, million dollars for the experience, but I won't pay a cent to do it over again. I guess that's, uh, that's my draftee of the Forgotten War. Do you have any questions? Do people call Korea the Forgotten War a lot? Yeah, yeah. That's common? Yeah. Do you feel that way? That yeah, so until recently, I think we were starting to get some recognition. Um, well, it had no purpose. Uh, I don't know, you get in the hand about MacArthur and Truman, uh, you know, there's several views of that. And who was right? Yeah, if we got the Chinese heavily involved in there, maybe we would have had the Third World War going on then. I, I, I can't answer that. Was it, you mentioned that it was very cold oh. back in 1951. Yeah. Is that it? When you were stationed over yeah. there? Like 30 below? Yes. How did you keep warm? So, uh, I questioned that myself, how we kept warm. We slept in tents. And then I remember the old Colonel O'Grady come by and quit burning fuel in them barrels so they'll spot you. You know, diesel fuel, you know, had, couldn't have no fires to stand by to warm. I don't, I don't know how we survived that myself. It must have been miserable. How about... Where, was there a warm season then? Well, yeah, it's the summertime. It was equivalent. It's about 38th parallel, so it's the equivalent of middle of Illinois in latitude. So that was a relief. Yeah. Do you have any good good memories about your war years over there? Well, I had our, our reunions were trying to get the people that you were slept or in the same tent or worked with and. So far, I've found one in St. Paul, but he never shows up to reunion. I'd like to get those assembled, you know, to see some of them. I never thought in the wildest dream that I'd ever go back to Korea twice since the place to see the thing, you know. You hear about the World War II veterans uh, going to see Normandy and stuff like that there. I guess my revisits to Korea is a highlight to that the world is getting much smaller. You can fly there in 14 hours, and it took 17 days to come home on the ship from Japan. It would have took 18 days 
from Korea, how small and tele you're just a telephone call away now or email is quicker yet. I guess I would want to know what uh, what weapons you were trained in. Oh, the carbine, the 30 caliber carbine. And I guess my job and the kid next door, we had the bazooka on there. My bazooka was under my cot, and the other kid had the ammunition for the thing. You slept with a bazooka under yeah. your cot? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was tit for tat when we were in Korea. Yeah. We finished up the bridge that one night, and and uh, I would say the main line of resistance was probably a half a mile away, and they lobbed in one mortar round on the top cord of the bridge, and like, ha ha, we well, you know you're done with the bridge; it's safe to drive across. So we better spend a couple more weeks mm -hmm. fixing that up, you know. So. While you were building these bridges, were you being protected by? Yeah, oh, yeah, you could hear artillery going over the top of there and the airstrikes. And it was a tit for tat war in the 52. Uh, oh, I remember one time we had 29 trucks in our company. Only two of them worked. They were all cannibalized. We had all the junk left over from the South Pacific. I mean, we could have fought a war if we wanted. And, uh, we were, we were just using old equipment. So you, you got the leftovers from World War II? Yeah, well, the South Pacific, with? all the stuff uh -huh. was. And then to come home and see the National Guards with all new equipment, we had all the all the junk, you know. That, that kind of gave us, uh, gave me a hard feeling about uh, not having, the, you know, the best, you know. That's hard to understand. The. Um Do you want to tell me about the relationships you had with the other men that you served with? Well, my best buddy was a kid from Forrest Anderson from the uh, state of Oregon. And there was another one, uh, Shorty Lundgren from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. You know, the, you remember those names, and uh, I haven't been able to find those two. And, you know, uh, we were all 19 years old or 20 at the most, and um, <laughs> none of us could fit in the uniform now that we were. We were all skinny kids, that's what we were. Um, I guess, uh, I, like, until you get to be age 40, you think you can live forever, you know, and nothing scared us, you know. Uh, Oh, well, I got run across my company commander at one of my reunions. He was 84 years old from Bloomington, Indiana. We overlapped one another uh, one month. He says, I got a little touch of Alzheimer's, and I don't remember you. And, and I says, I don't remember you, you know. I, but then remembered the name, you know. What was your rank when you came uh, out? Corporal. Uh, Mr. Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, froze the rank when we got there. And there was one first sergeant and three corporals in our company, and that was the the, uh, the ranking in there. You know, nobody that everybody had went home, rotated home, so they weren't spending money on salaries. I guess is what oh, you'd say. Oh, I see. Yeah. So. Your actual time in Korea was 13 months. Years? Oh, it's 13 months. Yeah. And that was 48 years ago. 48 years ago. Yesterday I got out 48 years ago. Camp Carson was a week after, no, it was a week after Easter Sunday. I was going through on the train and the, the canyon by Colorado Springs on Easter. I'll never forget that either. So. And uh, April 26th of this year, this month coming up, it'll be 50 years ago I left so uh, for the army. And I guess what it'd say uh, in our Elbin Township here, just in southeastern Dane County, they had every everybody drafted. They were drafted at 19 years old. They had the whole township cleaned out. They're eligible men.
you have anything else that you remember? <laughs> no, I... No, I... It comes back and forth, you know, you know. You think about what 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 happened, and you read. Uh, I my dad saved all the old letters, and I, uh, I kind of got reinforced by memory on that. I read those through here the, during the winter this year, and kind of got a order where we were in the various times of the the 13 months I spent over there, and then uh, it reinforces your memory of what you thought about. Were you getting mail quite regularly? Well, or, like, over there? Right, it would come in a cluster. I mean, you want to have mail for two or three weeks, then you'd get five or six letters. And I suppose uh, well, what about mail, you felt sorry for the, the, the few of the boys in the company that never got no mail. So you shared your newspapers or your box of cookies or, you know, like the old story about the Dear John letter. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And you shared your with those people. There was always a couple in the company that had that situation. You know, you wonder what they had for family. So there was a unique closeness. Yes. Among you. Well, thank you so much yes. for coming in and talking to us. Yes. I know it's not easy. No. And I hope that we'll see more. Korean War veterans? Yep. Maybe you can find a few. Yeah, I'll work on it. Okay. Yep. Okay, thanks a lot. Yep.